and welcome to the session for JBCN Conf on replicating production on your laptop using the magic of containers. My name is Grace Jansen and I'm a developer advocate at IBM in the UK and I primarily focus my time on sort of Java, JVM, cloud technologies um, and reactive technologies. If I don't get around to your questions in this session today, please feel free to follow me on Twitter, reach out, message me, tweet me. Uh, my handle is at GraceJansen27. So let's get started having a look at how we can create this sort of production environment using containers. But first of all, we have to take a look at the whole point of this talk, which is all about testing. So why do we write automated tests? Well, we were, if we were all perfect developers, we would just write code, we push it up, we deploy it immediately, probably on a, on a Friday afternoon, straight into production, and we wouldn't get calls at 2 a.m. for support. Unfortunately, this isn't the case. Uh, we don't live in this perfect world, and we aren't always perfect developers. So we need to write tests. And that's to make sure that we have the confidence that our applications work the way we want them to. It's all about making sure that what we had planned actually uh, follows through within our code. And there are various different types of tests we can make use of to test our applications. Here's a pyramid showing sort of the proportions of the different kinds of tests we want to be applying to our applications. So the first of those at the bottom is the base of this pyramid. It makes up the, the vast majority in terms of numbers of tests that we want to run on our system or on our application, and that's unit tests. So unit tests, you've probably come across them before, you're probably using tons of them in your own application. They are typically automated tests that are written and run by software developers to basically make sure that a section or a particular part of an application known as the unit meets its design and behaves as we intended it to. So essentially, this could be, in procedural programming terms, an entire module, but it's more commonly sort of an individual function or procedure. The next one up in our pyramid is integration testing. Integration testing is sort of a level of software testing where individual units that we had in those unit testing or individual components are combined together and they're tested as a group. So the purpose of this level of testing is to expose faults in the integration or the interaction between these different units or between these components. And we want less integration tests than we want unit tests. And that's because integration tests take a bit more time to write, more resources and effort to be able to run, um, and they are slightly more expensive. So we want less integration tests. We still want to use them, but slightly less than the number of unit tests we have. And then we have system or UI or sometimes called end-to-end -end testing. So that is testing your application completely as it would be in production. Again, this takes even more resources, time and effort. And so we want less of these than we do of the others. Hence why it's at the top of the pyramid. Most applications benefit from having sort of this balanced mix of the variety of types of automated tests that we can use to be able to capture the various different types of errors that might be creeping into our systems. In terms of the exact composition or proportion of each of these tests, that mix varies depending on sort of the nature of your project, the type of application you're writing. But in general, the amount of each type of test should roughly follow this pyramid shape. Um, so the bulk of your test should be in your units, at the bottom, unit tests at the bottom of the pyramid. And as you move up the pyramid, uh, your tests get larger, but at the same time, the number of tests in terms of the width of the pyramid gets smaller. However, when it comes to reality, a lot of us don't actually manage this type of pyramid. Instead, our pyramids look a bit more like this. We have a huge heavy dependency on unit tests. They make up the vast majority of our pyramid, um, and that's because they're fairly easy to write, um, and we're able to do that as we develop in sort of TDD-driven development, test-driven development. We do still generally have integration testing. We do have that within our code. Uh, however, it is harder to fit in, it takes more time, and so we might not have as many as we probably should. And then in terms of system or end-to-end -end testing, often it requires manual testing, so it's a, whole, it's a case of, oh, if I have time and I remember, then I'll do it. So it's harder to fit these in. But they're really important that we do spend time on this and that we try and get the proportions um, to be the best possible for our application. That's because this is what we end up with if we have a huge dependency on unit tests or if we just use unit tests. So here is a sync, and if we test the sync with uh, unit tests, 
it actually passes. So the tap turns on, the tap turns off, the drain works and the sink doesn't overflow. But when you actually take a look at the sink, I can't wash my hands in it, I can't fill a drink in it. As a whole, this sink kind of sucks. It doesn't do the job it was meant to do. And so actually, if you were to use this, an integration test on this, or even an end-to-end -end UI acceptance system test on this, you'd realize that actually there are some major faults with it, some major errors that means it's essentially unusable. So it's important that we make time for those other tests, those integration tests, those system tests, um, so that we ensure our application doesn't come across any errors that wouldn't be picked up by unit tests. So we're gonna take a look at a type of integration testing today, and that is utilizing containers to be able to test our applications. So why containers? Well, containers bring with them a certain amount of magic. So what magic do we gain from containers? We sort of moved, our, our applications have evolved to move towards this idea of containerization. And that's because we gain all of these benefits from it. So we have this virtualization from the OS level, which means it's really lightweight and very fast to start up. We have portability in terms of utilizing images and config files like Dockerfile. We're able to run our applications anywhere, so they're extremely portable. We have great flexibility with what we're utilizing underneath our applications. We have isolation, so we're able to completely isolate our application, but we do have added complexity, so that is something we have to bear in mind. Not only do we gain advantages from utilizing containers, we also gain advantages from utilizing automation and management software or, or tools and technologies uh, of containers. So for example, Kubernetes. And with Kubernetes, we get additional magic, we get additional benefits, and that's things like automated rollouts and rollbacks, being able to automatically scale services, having health monitoring, which is really important because when you're deploying applications to the cloud, then you're uh, essentially, they're, they're very remote, they're not in your local service. So it's important that we're able to monitor the health of those distributed services or components so that we know if there's a potential point of contention or failure within our application because we've got an unhealthy server somewhere. We're able to use declarative management and as I said before, deploy anywhere and that can improve, in, include hybrid deployments. So what magic can we as developers actually use from this? Well, it allows us to have isolated development environments. As I said before, portability is a huge one, being able to port that between various different environments depending on what we're doing in terms of the development stage. We're able to use pre-configured images, which saves us time as developers having to pre-configure that all beforehand, which means, again, we have really fast startup of applications as well. We don't need to have so many prerequisites installed on our local machines, and we can have version control of dependencies. But the two that I'm most interested in, especially for this presentation, is the fact that utilizing containers and management tools like Kubernetes allows us to easily develop for cloud infrastructure, so to build cloud native applications, and enable us to have true to production testing. Why is this important? Why does it, and how does containers allow us to do this? Well, this is important because actually, if we look at methodologies that help us to become cloud native and to really thrive in the cloud instead of just survive in the cloud for our applications, one of them, which is extremely popular, is the 12 factor app methodology. This methodology lays out 12 key factors or behaviors that our application should be sort of mimicking or striving towards if we want to really make them cloud native to the core and be able to thrive in that environment. And in order to achieve this, one of the factors is called dev prod parity. And this is why it's so important that we have that true to production testing environment. What do I mean by dev prod parity? Dev prod parity is all about keeping your development, staging and production environments or any other environment you might use like QA, for example, um, or various other ones as similar as possible. It's all about trying to utilize the same tools, the same um, dependencies, the same stack, that trying to keep them as similar as possible. And that's because when you don't keep them as similar as possible, you end up with issues between them, which means that if I've got, uh, a, if for example, I have uh, a different tool that I'm using in development versus production, I can have this tools gap. As you can see, I've listed some common issues that people come across when they're not similar. One of those is the tools gap. So with the tools gap, you might be using one software stack locally in your development environment because maybe it's faster or maybe it's more convenient. 
but you might be using a much more robust software stack in production. But this gap between those tools that you're using means that when you're testing in one environment, you might end up with completely different results in a different environment because you're using different tools. The same thing for the personnel gap. So the, the person writing the change locally might be a developer, but that developer might be a different person to the ops person who's actually going to be going and deploying it. And they might end up configuring it in different ways. And that change between those two different people, again, could mean potential errors that we hadn't spotted before going into production. And then the time gap. So this is relating to sort of the amount of time it takes you to write a code change and to actually get that code change pushed into production. And that can cause issues because there might be more changes in the code base or the tools between when you make the change and when your change actually goes into production. All of these issues, the fact that these aren't similar or as similar as possible, means that you can have this common issue. Well, it works on my machine. That's not good enough. It should work on every machine because each of your environments, or, or when I say machine, it could be an environment, um, and each of those environments should be as similar as possible so that when you're testing in your QA environment, you're able to pick up any errors that might potentially then have occurred had you just skipped straight to production by keeping it all as similar as possible. And testing can, uh, with containers can actually help solve a lot of these problems. So testing problems that containers can solve includes things like um, enabling data access to external or third party databases, uh, being able to do integration testing in that containerized environment, which is what you'd be using in production. So really mimicking exactly what you'd have in production by utilizing that container. Being able to have automatic updating and version controls like we discussed before as one of those pieces of magic that we can use. Uh, reducing that complex setup on local machines and enabling that portable testing environment. That's probably one of the biggest advantages of utilizing containers when you're testing. Not only is it as close to production as possible, it also allows you to port that testing environment so others can then run the same test easily and hopefully come up with exactly the same errors or response that you had when you were testing it. And that allows you to sort of work as a team to be able to solve that instead of, you know, as well as saying it works on my machine, it also solves the problem of, well, it doesn't work on my machine. And so you're able to sort of make sure that this doesn't happen and that you can work as a team to be able to test your applications appropriately and effectively. So to do that, we have a sort of library here that we're going to be taking a look at called test containers. The link is at the bottom if you'd like to take a closer look at this. Essentially, test containers is a Java library that provides really lightweight, throwable instances of essentially anything that can run in a Docker container. And it supports things like JUnit tests. So taking a closer look, it allows you to create really easy integration tests that are easy to set up, easy to write, and easy to run. And it tests your application in the same way that they would run in production, hence the use of containers. If you're going to be utilizing containers in your cloud native application in production, it makes sense that you test it in the same environment utilizing containers um, in your QA environment and in your dev environment to make that dev prod parity as consistent as possible. And these tests are portable to any compatible implementation. Um, this is an open source library, so you can use any of these implementations. The ones we're going to be look taking a look at in our demo today is Open Liberty, uh, which is our IBM's open source application server. Test containers uh, allows you to do sort of a variety of different tests and make these tests easier. And that includes things like uh, data access layer integration tests, application integration tests, UI and acceptance tests, and also uh, many more tests via contributed modules. So for example, the, some of the available test container modules include various database modules, uh, including DB2, MySQL, Progress, MongoDB, Couchbase, as well as other modules like Elasticsearch, Kafka, uh, Nginx, RabbitMQ, and Docker Compose. So all of these enable you to be able to connect to these backing services just as you would in production to be able to do it in that test environment and to make those that DevPod parity consistent. We're going to be utilizing sort of a version of test containers, which is microshed testing. So what is microshed testing? Here's a basic definition. Essentially, it's a framework that's all about enabling that true to production integration tests on your local machine. So it makes use of sort of the test containers library and it enables developers to be able to minimize the amount of test failures due to those differences between the various environments. And it makes use of the magic of containers to be able to replicate what you have in your production environment without much setup on your end at all. 
It works with sort of a variety of different Jakarta EE and microprofile runtimes. As I said, the one we're going to be utilizing today is Open Liberty. So let's take a look at how we actually utilize microshed testing. So microshed testing works by utilizing annotations, very similar to a lot of other sort of frameworks or toolkits that you might be using. And actually, there are four main annotations we need to know when we're utilizing microshed. So one of them is at microshed annot test annotation. This, er this sort of annotation at the top that you see on the top right is required so that the build then knows that this is a microshed test. You then also need the app container annotation. This annotation is required for you to be able to set up your container to run your tests inside. So this states any of the configuration that you might need to give for that container setup. Then we also have the at rest client annotation. This is needed for us to test something against. So microshed testing is a form of black box testing. So it doesn't actually have any access internally to your application logic. So instead we need to use HTTP requests to be able to test and sort of test your application. And so to do that, we need something to test against. And so we need this at rest client annotation. And the last annotation we need is the at test annotation. So just like you would be doing with a normal sort of JUnit test, um, you'd use this at test annotation for each of the tests that you want to run within your test class. Now, microshed testing also works with Spock as well as with JUnit 4 and 5. As well as these annotations, microshed testing enables you to utilize um, another configuration, another sort of uh, annotation, which is the at shared container annotation. Notice in this one, we've just got at container. Now this is because um, when you think about it, if you were to have to create a container for every test or every test class that you create, when you're testing your applications, that's a lot of containers to be spinning up and testing your application against or within. So instead, uh, microshed testing enables you to be more efficient with the number of containers that you're utilizing by having shareable configuration. So being able to utilize the same uh, instance of an application within a container to be able to test multiple test classes. So if multiple test classes can share the same container instance, you can then offload that configuration into a separate class and then reference that using the, the at shared container um, annotation, config annotation. So you can see here at the top, we've got that at container annotation, which we'd then be able to port out into a separate class. And then we use that at shared container config uh, annotation that you can see underneath the various microshed tests underneath. And actually, this is something that you can do in our lab later on. As I said, there are various different runtimes you can use this on. Many of them are open source. So if you'd like to take a look at them, feel free. The one we're using is Open Liberty. So now I'm going to show you just how easy it can be to turn a normal JUnit test into a microshed test to really make the most of that DevProc parity and test in true to production environments. So for this, we're going to be utilizing something called Skills Network Labs. This is an online environment that we created in IBM to make it easier for you to get hands on with technologies and tools and APIs uh, that you might be interested in. So it is an online only environment, so you don't need any prerequisites on your local machine, which is great. And it has instructions on the left hand side and an online IDE on the right hand side. This is all running in the IBM cloud and utilizing things like Eclipse Chain. So we've also got, as well as an IDE, we've also got a terminal so we can edit the code, um, run the code, deploy the code, etc. So we're going to be doing this demo today. If you would like to take a look at this demo afterwards, I'll probably be going through it quite quickly given the time today. But if you'd like to go through it in more detail afterwards or do any of the other modules we have in this workshop, um, then take a look at the workshop link I provided here. The one we'll be doing today is all about turning a JUnit test into a microshed test. So I'm going to get started with that now. Um, and switch over to my browser. So here's my browser. So as you can see, I, I've already done some of the steps. So I'm actually on step four of nine, and this is just to, to save time. Essentially what I've done here is cloned the Git repository, CD'd into the start directory, which is the directory we provide you with in all of our guides and labs to build upon via the steps in this instruction. If you want to take a look at the finished product, the one that you'll get to at the very end of this lab, then check out the finished directory. So I've already CD'd into start, and what I've done is I've run Liberty Dev Mode. Liberty Dev Mode is short for development mode, and it essentially means that we um, dynamically recompile the application for you when you make changes and you save those to any of the classes within your application. 
and this just means that it's going to be a bit quicker for me to run the tests. It's designed for rapid, agile, iterative development. So that's exactly what we're doing now. So I'm going to use dev mode. So as you can see here, um, dev mode has already started. As you can see, it says Liberty is running in dev mode. So all I need to do to kick off the test is just go into the terminal and hit enter. And it's going to start running those tests for me. Now, I've already got up this, the test class here. If you want to do the same, you can go into the Explorer, go through the directory and find the test class. As you can see here, I've got one test and you can see that test has successfully run. So now I'm going to have a go at switching that test to be a microshed test instead of just a generic JUnit test. So to do that, what I need to do is first add the app microshed test annotation. Remember, that was the one that told the build that this is going to be a microshed test annotation. And then I also need to add the app container annotation and any of the configuration that's needed for the setup of that container. So in this case, we're providing it with that app, with app construct string root string method, which essentially indicates the base path of the application. So in this case, we're utilizing slash guide microshed testing. I'm also providing it with this with readiness path string method, which indicates what path needs to be polled by HTTP to determine whether the application is ready or not. It's really important that we do this because if we didn't do it, our application might stop, it might try and test our application before our container is up and running and ready to be tested. So what I'm going to do is copy and paste this and you can just replace everything within this file with the code that we provided. We provided these really handy copy and paste buttons and in the instructions and any code that you need to copy is in those white boxes. So it should make it quite easy to follow. So now I'm going to open up a new terminal and essentially test that this application is, uh, is able to, is up and running and healthy. So we're just going to curl, use this curl command to do that. And as you can see, it is up, which is fantastic. So make sure that you save your changes as you go along because uh, this IDE does not automatically save for you. So now that we've added in the at microshed test annotation and the at container annotation, the next thing we need to do is add in the at rest client annotation so we can actually talk to our application. Now remember, we need to use the HTTP request to be able to do that because we're using this black box type testing so we can't actually access the application internals. So we're going to be adding this um, this REST client annotation, as you can see here, which enables us to have something to test against. So again, just highlight everything, copy and paste, um, and it will add that in for you. So the next thing we're going to do is actually put something in this test so that we're actually testing some part of our application now that we can talk to it. And what we're going to try and test first is just a really simple test. We're just going to test whether we can create a person in our application. So our application should be able to create people, look up the ages of people, um, and there's multiple different people that have already been created in this application. So we're going to copy and paste this text that we provided here. Essentially, the only thing that's changed is the stuff inside the test. So just like you would do with the JUnit test, we're just going to update that. You can either do that manually by copying and pasting the parts that have changed or copy and paste the whole thing and replace it all. So you can see here we're trying to create a person called Hank who's 42. So to be able to test this, I'm going to head back to that tab, that, that terminal tab I had open with dev mode running. As you can see, my tests have been recompiling as I've been saving them. Um, and that's due to the fact that I'm using dev mode. So now I'm just going to hit um, enter and that should start the application off for me. Um, so now it's going to start the tests. And then we should see that they uh, successfully run. Yep, fantastic. So they've successfully run which is great to see. And you can see here that we are starting an, a container for this. So you can see we're now not doing it locally. We are using microshed testing and we are using that container to test. So now we're going to run multiple tests. Most of the time we don't just have one single test running. So we're going to run multiple tests. You can see here I've got a lot more tests in my file that we're doing. In total, I believe it's six tests that we're going to run now. So again, you can just copy and paste that whole thing over, copy and paste, and remember to save. Uh, and then I'm going to, again, you can see here at the bottom, my tests have recompiled dynamically. So I'm just going to hit enter to be able to run those tests. You can also do it outside of development mode. So if you don't want to run it using development mode, so for example, uh, maybe you're running it in a CICD pipeline and you want to test it that way, uh, then you can also run it utilizing Maven goals like MVM Verify. Fantastic. So you can see here in my terminal that my tests have successfully run and all six have passed. And you can see that I'm utilizing a, con a single container for all of this to be able to test it in. If I continue, 
So the next thing I'd need to do is create a configurable, a shared configuration class. So to be able to do this, I'm going to create this second test class so that it's not just one test class that I'm running. So I can utilize this uh, touch command to be able to do that. So it's now, oh, oh, I'm trying to run it in dev mode, that's why. If I go into my other tab, don't run it in the dev mode tab, do it in here to create that. I can then open it up here. You can see my new test class just here. So I'm going to copy and paste in the code that I've got here, which is essentially just adding some more test tests uh, to this test class, as you can see. So now I'm going to, um, the next thing I need to do is create that shared configuration class that I haven't got yet. And that's because right now I've got the at container config, um, annotation and the same configuration within it for both tests. When in reality, because they're the same, I could just use the same container instance by taking that configuration out, putting it in a separate container, um, shared container file, configuration file, and then utilizing the at shared um, config annotation in the two test classes. So for that, I need to create this app deployment config class. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that and paste. Because right now, if I was to try and run this, uh, which you can do using the MVM verif the Maven verify command, and you can see that actually two containers will start running, one for the first test class, then it will shut down, and then a second container will be started for the second test class. And it takes much longer than it would do if you were utilizing the same container instance. Uh, it's just not very efficient in terms of time or resources. So instead, we're going to create this shared configuration. So I just need to head into that app deployment config file um, and then copy and paste in this code. So you can see, if you recognize the code from the other file, we've actually got exactly the same code here. I've just taken it and ported it out into, a, into an external configuration file. So now the next stage is for me to update the two test classes so that they don't have that at container annotation. And so that instead, instead of having this at container and the import, instead they're now utilizing this at shared container config annotation. So again, you can just copy and paste uh, these in if you'd like to. So I'm going to edit the person service it.java first, paste that in, and then I'm going to edit the second one as well. Error path it, delete and paste. So now when you run the MVM verify, it will utilize that shared container configuration. And so it's much more resource efficient and you're able to get that true to production testing uh, and it's much, much quicker. So that's how easy it is to get started. It literally took us less than 10 minutes to get going uh, to be able to turn a JUnit test into a microshed test and get it in a more true to production environment. Go back to my slides. Hopefully in summary, what I've shown you is that containers are amazing. They make developers' lives easier by enabling portability, configuration, being able to have configurable apps, and they're lightweight. They help us to solve some of the issues with testing that we come up against, especially things like the dev test prod parity, so enabling that, that similarity between the various environments. And there are some great open source tools available for you to be able to utilize if you want to try testing with containers, uh, things like test containers and microshed testing, as we saw. And this all helps developers, but it also helps speed up that time to production, making everyone happier. So if I haven't given you enough links already throughout my presentation, here are a bunch of resources you can check out if you'd like to sort of research this more going on. We've got an article that takes you through utilizing microshed testing. If you want a written version of what I've talked through in this presentation, head to that first link. Or if you want to check out some of the other Java frameworks you could use to automate your testing, check out that second link. For any of the technologies I've referenced throughout this presentation, I put the links at the bottom of this page as well. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this presentation. And uh, if you have any questions that I haven't answered, head to my Twitter handle there. Thanks so much.